Good afternoon and welcome to Wider Than Precision Medicine, Leveraging IT for a Holistic Patient Engagement Approach, a webinar tweet chat combo from healthsystemcio.com. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I will be your moderator today. We are having a simultaneous tweet chat hosted by our Managing Editor and Director of Social Media, Kate Gamble. You can participate in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat, or you can view the tweet chat in the media viewer panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will also be using the Q&A panel today. You can send your questions in at any time. We'll leave the default set to all panelists, and we'll take those later in the program. And you can download the deck by using the URL on your screen. It'll be sent out in the chat box, and it's at the bottom of some of our slides. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to hear from our featured speaker, Lisa Stump, SVP and CIO at Yale New Haven Health System and Yale School of Medicine. And then we will have our Q&A with Lisa. So without further delay, I'm going to go and turn it over to Lisa Stump. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited today to talk about um, this topic that I'm very passionate about, which is the potential that we all have to leverage technology to truly care for patients, taking a very wide view of what's important to people, uh, as well as that deep and narrow view uh, that we have the opportunity to leverage data to drive care. So let's start with what we tend to see when we think about caring for patients. We've spent decades now and billions of dollars developing and deploying technology and IT systems that help us document care. And what do we document? We tend to document what we did to whom, when, and why. We're now poised to use those data in really impactful ways. But our view based on these traditional data, what you see at the top of the iceberg, tends to be very narrow. It tends to be based on things we can generally see, patient demographics, like their gender, their age, their race. We focus on things like diagnoses, medication lists, and problem lists. And like this proverbial iceberg, it's tr we traditionally focus on just this tiny piece that we can see. But if we look deeper, and we tend to do that, as clinicians in medicine, we pride ourselves on perfection and precision, and we dig deep. We're now capturing things like biometric data in real time, patients' heart rate, blood pressure, weight from wearables and home devices. And even more deeply, we have detailed information about cellular makeup, genetic data, and all of this allows us to drive care in meaningful ways with powerful potential, not just to cure disease, but to actually prevent it. But what I think presents tremendous opportunity for us is this big wide piece in the middle. Things like what's important to individuals, their perceptions of health, their individual goals. You know, you and I are completely different individuals and level of function and perceptions of health vary widely across this population that we're here and privileged to serve. We all have very different values and beliefs about the world and our health and our place in the world. There's environmental and social data that impact our overall health. And then we all have very different decision-making styles, including how we make decisions about our health and the role that we want to play in those healthcare decisions. And so I ask us to think about what's really important to people. And I've deliberately, and I will try for the remainder of the talk, to stop talking about patients. Because if we focus only on people when they are in our care as patients, we've missed an incredible opportunity to understand all of those pieces in the middle of the iceberg. In this study conducted in June of 2015, it was a unique study that actually looked at people on the street, literally, and asked them what they wanted from healthcare. 
And it wasn't, you know, the most scholarly physician. It wasn't the most pristine hospital building or clinic. It was these simple, basic things. People want to be listened to. They want to be cared for and about. We want to have things explained well to us, again, so that we can be part of making decisions about our care. People want to be treated as individuals and with respect. We want convenience and we want transparency about cost. We want to understand what's going in uh, to that, that health care cost that, that we need to be a part of bearing. And basically, people want choice. Now, if we think about the data sets that I started about talking about a few minutes ago, we don't tend to capture these pieces of data very well at all in traditional healthcare settings and things like our electronic medical records. And that's what I wanted to focus on today. And in that, I think, lies that tremendous opportunity to truly individualize and personalize care. And when I think about doing that, I think about the roles of technology across this care continuum. If we start at the top, we're talking about population health, not population health care. Again, health care focuses on individuals when they're already sick, but really about population health. How do we drive the circumstances and then when we need to provide the treatments that help individuals attain their individual health goals? Now, at some point, patients will need health care, and we need to ideally attract them to the right services. And we're at that next panel of this slide. Then patients, once there are patients, will move in and out of various states of being chronically well, chronically ill. They'll come to us for hospitalization or procedures, move into a post-acute care setting uh, where we might be continuing to monitor and, and provide health care. And people will move back and forth between this, these various phases, ideally while we're continuing to focus on their overall health. Through all of it, we want to be sure that we're understanding the patient experience. And what does that mean? We need to understand patients' expectations. We need to be delivering service excellence and measuring those before patients interact with us so that we have an opportunity to meet those expectations, and certainly as we're providing and after we've provided our service so that we can continually improve. And then it's often overlooked, but we need to focus on supporting our care team. If we have a harried and stressed physician or office staff in the physician office, that doesn't make for a very rewarding experience uh, for the patient or the care team. And that's an, an area that we can overall improve upon. Now, I won't spend a lot of time talking about how we can support the care team, but I will say that's a very rich topic, uh, an area of incredible focus. There is tremendous opportunity for technology to help in that arena, but again, just not our focus for today. So let's dive into what I think are some of the technology opportunities to help us meet those expectations of what people really want uh, from their health and their health care. If we remember, people said they wanted convenience. And one of the ways that we can meet that, uh, and this is a strategy that we've undertaken here at Yale New Haven Health System, is to be as accessible uh, in online media as we can be to provide direct online resources to help people find the care providers or physicians that they need to book that appointment online. And we've gone further with this uh, to allow patients to check in for that appointment, to pay their bill online, to communicate with the office or the physician prior to um, coming in for the appointment. And again, at the heart of the convenience, as they're looking for that provider, I have the opportunity as a consumer to search for care that's located near my home or near my work, that accepts my insurance, that speaks the language that I am most comfortable in or recognizes my cultural uniqueness. So these are all really important tools when we think about the, the element of convenience. And what's more convenient than to have that care delivered where I am, not 
being required to get into my car, drive to a medical office building, find parking, and go into the doctor's office, but instead seeing the doctor from where I sit, whether that be at home, at work, or on the soccer field, uh, and telemedicine really allows us to do that and to deliver care where it's convenient and when it's convenient for, for our patients uh, and the customers that we serve. So this is an incredibly important strategy, and there are many tools now that allow us to do this, um, either through the electronic medical record vendors have partnered with technology companies that allow us to deliver this service through our online patient portal connected with the EMR, and there are certainly uh, many third-party solutions and national uh, telemedicine services that allow us to deliver this type of care. I, one of my favorite patient stories is we had one of our surgeons here begin delivering telemedicine visits, and uh, he is a transplant surgeon, and the very first visit he conducted, the patient was uh, an older man in his car uh, while his wife was in the beauty salon getting her hair done, uh, and he was able he was incredibly grateful to the surgeon uh, for not requiring him to tell his wife he couldn't take her for that very important appointment. But I think underscores how convenient and important and rewarding uh, this type of care delivery can be. Now, I'm the CIO today, but I started my career as a pharmacist. And so improving medication safety and medication instructions will always be incredibly important for me. And again, one of the things that people before there are patients uh, will tell us they want is to have things explained clearly. Now, unfortunately, when we go to our pharmacies today, when we get information about our medications, it tends to look like this medication sheet that you see. It looks like the Encyclopedia Britannica version, very small print, lots of information, somewhat difficult to understand. Um, and I think we can do much better uh, in delivering this type of information to the people that we care for. And so what you see on the right uh, is one technology solution. It's just an example of how we can deliver the same information. Um, and you see what are really important features. It uses simple icons and pictograms to help patients understand when the medication should be taken. The font is large. Um, the information is simple. Most of the bullet points are a single line. Um, and all of these instructions fit on a single page rather than the multiple column, multiple page that, that we tend to see. And so again, when we think about how do we meet patients where they are, meet people where they are in their healthcare, this is just one way that we can improve uh, our ability to do that. And probably my favorite piece uh, of this story is Technology that allows us to really understand who people are. Um, and this piece really gets that, that middle piece of the iceberg. We are working with one company, um, and this is just an example uh, of how we are doing that, that allows the patient to tell us who they are, to tell us their story, to tell us what makes them happy, what their priorities and goals are, Patients have the ability to tell us what, their, what pressures are presenting barriers to their achievement of those health goals. So things like what we tend to call the social determinants of health or worries. Are there financial concerns? Are there basic food, shelter, transportation concerns? Do they have an advanced directive? Who's important in helping them make decisions? This is the piece that we tend in very traditional healthcare data collection strategies, this is the piece that we tend to miss. And the opportunity to start to collect this information, present it to caregivers in the context of the electronic medical record without forcing them to go somewhere else and look for it, we think is an incredibly important strategy in helping us to deliver that personal care that we strive to deliver. And we're just starting uh, to use tools like this uh, to help us understand who our, who our patients and our consumers and customers really are. And so now let's talk about that deep, sharp point of the iceberg. And precision medicine, I think, is a new, exciting field that 
allows us at that basic genetic level to understand what makes up uh, how a patient will respond to a given therapy and to truly deliver individualized care. So in most medical decisions, our clinicians or physicians are operating on the law of averages. So without precision medicine, a patient presents, is diagnosed with a condition like hypertension, and our physicians think about, again, the law of averages. So if I were the patient in this scenario, the physician would say, for a typical white middle-aged female, and unfortunately, that's my description, what therapy has been shown in the literature to be most effective? And they would start me on that therapy. And if I was like the average white middle-aged female, I would respond. But not all of us are in that average. And so many patients have no benefit from that therapy or have side effects, adverse outcomes from that therapy. And we go through a cycle of going back to the doctor, getting rechecked, medications and treatments are changed, and over some significant time, we might get to the right outcome and get our blood pressure under control. Instead, with precision medicine, we look at the genetic makeup of that patient because, among many other things, the way that we respond to medications is scripted in our genes. And so understanding that genetic makeup allows our clinicians to create that personalized plan and know that we should skip what are the traditional tier one and two treatment options because I, as an individual patient, am only going to respond safely to option three. And so this is incredibly powerful uh, in our ability to customize therapy. And I think a patient's story probably demonstrates this best. Uh, and it's a, it's a sad story, but I think gets the message home really well. There was a young boy named Solomon. Uh, he lived in Wisconsin, and at nine years old, he had a routine surgical procedure to remove his tonsils and adenoids. And again, his clinicians did the right thing based on the law of averages. For a child of his size and age, he was prescribed an appropriate pain medication called oxycodone at the appropriate dose. He was given one dose before he left the outpatient surgery center, went home, parents gave him a second appropriate dose at the scheduled time, and within a short time, this child started to have severe respiratory distress. He had difficulty breathing, and parents called 911. He needed to be rushed back to the ICU in the hospital, and unfortunately, he passed away three days later. Now, a detailed investigation was done. Um, there was no medication error, the right dose was prescribed, the right dose and concentration were dispensed by the pharmacy, the right doses were given by the hospital and by uh, his family at home. Now, we didn't do genetic testing on Solomon, but the only likely explanation is that the way he metabolized that narcotic medication produced an overabundance of the medication in his bloodstream. He, he wasn't the average patient. And unfortunately, as a result, had a buildup of the medication that caused a very known side effect in respiratory distress, and he passed away. Now, if instead we had tested this child and other patients to understand their metabolic pathway, a different medication or a much lower dose could be prescribed, and we have the opportunity to avoid these very unfortunate avoidable events. So I hope I've given you a picture today of our opportunity to use technology and data from that very tip of the iceberg and the traditional data that we collect today, our diagnoses, our problem lists and medication lists, down to that very fine point of our genetic makeup um, that will allow us to deliver very precise health care. And more importantly, that big swath in the middle that allows us to individualize health and the plan to achieve and maintain health that is based on lots of other non-traditional data sets, um, but that we truly have the ability to collect today. And my hope in, in having this conversation today was to demonstrate that that future, which is very attainable, is not something we simply enter 
but that future where we can individualize care and health is very much something that we have the ability to create. And so I hope that was helpful discussion. Uh, and Anthony, at that point, I'll turn it back to you. Very good, very good. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, for that great presentation. And now we have time for some Q&A. So as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, go ahead and send those questions in the, as they occur to you. Uh, send them in now, and we will get them in front of Lisa. Uh, Lisa, so let me start out by asking you about the environmental and social data you mentioned. Um, are there any concerns when trying to elicit some of this information or use it to take actions? Are there privacy concerns? Do you see any patients possibly being reluctant to give any of the data that you're looking for in order to give the care you want to give? Yeah, it's a great question, Anthony. You know, I, I think there will certainly be some individuals who are reluctant to give us that information. Um, but on the positive side, I think there will be many who, if we help paint the picture of why that's important, will want to share it. And we then have the opportunity to um, demonstrate the, the ability to use those data. So I think the other important piece, you know, I would tell you one thing that I worry about is in deploying applications or, or tools like I've shown, once we create the expectation, we, we present uh, a tool that lets patients tell us their story. If we then don't look at it or respond to it, um, I think we, we further damage the, the trust and the relationship with the patient. So it is a big responsibility uh, once we have the information to use it. For, for the good of our patients. I think it, it becomes important patient information just like the PHI that we're bound to protect, and I, I think we, we will do that well. I think more importantly, it's that we need to use the data once we have it. Yeah, and I, was, I actually wrote that question down as you were talking about collecting the, the different types of information around sort of happiness and, and what makes people tick and all that. Um, that we know that in many healthcare environments, I mean, clinicians are uh, completely running around busy just to do the basics. Um, so to your point that you just made, that you don't want to collect information that just sits somewhere. It maybe feels good to the patient as it's been collected, but if nobody is then taking actions off on it, it's even worse maybe than not collecting it at all. So what resources do you yep. put in place? Are there... Tell me about the, the, I would imagine you need additional people. You can't expect the doctors and nurses to do this. They're already overwhelmed. That's my take. Yeah, so we, we looked at it as um, we needed to present the information in the most meaningful way and at the right point in care. So I will say, as we first went out and talked to physicians about our ability to collect the information, I would say uniformly from physicians, I was told, get me this information now. How quickly can you get it for me? So I think mm -hmm. it's very rewarding to know that caregivers do want to know patients. But you're right. They're busy and they're, we're presenting them with information overload, alert fatigue, all of the other things we need to balance. So we worked with um, the vendor that helped us create that product um, to make sure it was presented in that meaningful way, in the natural workflow of the physician. And so it's integrated with our electronic medical record. Uh, the button that would display that one page view, and it is one screen, so another key design point. All of the information presents on one screen. Um, the button that launches it is only active, so it, it lights up when the patient has an account that, that has that information in it. If the patient hasn't created it, the button's grayed out. So we tried to alleviate, you know, that sort of needle in a haystack. I have to keep clicking to see if my patient uh, completed that information. So, you know, again, I think as health IT professionals, taking those important design considerations into account is, is critical. Um, and as we started to deploy it, again, very positively, Physicians find it rewarding uh, and valuable, and, and the, the use is, is bearing out. 
Very good. Next question. How can organiz organizations reconcile the seemingly opposite goals of reducing unwarranted care variation and costs with wanting to provide likely more expensive individualized patient treatments? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So, um, you know, I think actually in individualizing care, it's less expensive. So if I go back to that example of the newly diagnosed hypertensive patient, um, if we follow that normal law of averages, they get started on the first line therapy, um, they take it for three months, they go back to the doctor's office to get checked, only to find that their blood pressure is still not under control. We go to second line treatment, they try it for another few months, they go back to the doctor, still not under control, finally to be placed on the third line therapy, which is the one that's effective for them. We've now had a patient go months without getting the condition under control, and so whatever adverse outcomes are, are resulting from that, they've spent good money on drugs that are not effective. Um, and instead, if we can tailor that therapy right up front, our money is well spent on therapy that is effective and we get the outcome, which overall will, will save care um, or save dollars. You know, the, the other example, um, the antiplatelet medications, the drugs that prevent blood clots after a patient has um, a procedure done on their heart to open a, a clotted vessel. Again, some patients respond very well to what we call the first-line therapy. Others do not but we put everyone on the first-line therapy. Now, if you're in that small percentage of patients who don't respond, one of the ways we might discover that is that you have another heart attack and land in our emergency department, or worse, die <laughs> before coming back to the hospital. Um, both of those have incredible societal and monetary costs when instead, if we know what therapy is going to be most effective, we get you on it uh, right at the initiation and we have better outcomes. So better quality actually saves money. And I think that's a correlation that, that many people miss, um, but it's absolutely true. Let's talk a little bit about the idea of you know, the story you told about Solomon, and you may have covered some of this in your last answer, but the idea that if, you, if we were able to do uh, certain types of testing, genetic testing, whatever the testing is actually called, uh, metabolic uh, pathways, you said understanding is metabolic pathways, is that feasible to be able to do that type of testing on any individual who's going to receive any kind of medication? Um, so not every medication is influenced by that. Uh, there are probably 60 to 80 classes of medications that have a known metabolic pathway that we can detect in mm -hmm. the gene makeup. And so, you know, the, the, and we don't need to sequence the entire human genome to, to get at that important part of the, the genome. And mm -hmm. so, the, the test costs probably three to four hundred dollars, um, and so admittedly, uh, you know, a, a new expense. But to avoid those downstream costs of ineffective medications, potential side effects, or untreated conditions, the three to four hundred dollars more than likely pays for itself um, as as we start to do that. And over time, with scale and economies of scale, the cost of those tests will continue to come right. down. All right. So you're a proponent of that actually happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you think healthcare providers and plans, uh, health plans can do to drive consumer and patient awareness and understanding of precision medicine? Yeah, you know, I, I do think we all are responsible for that communication. Um, you know, I think our health, pan, health plans and payers, in the interest of the patients that they serve, um, can provide incentives for their members 
partake in what are really important activities. So just like many health plans today offer incentives for healthy behaviors, right? If we go for our screening colonoscopies, um, or if we don't go for our screening colonoscopies, in some cases we, we see penalties. Um, you know, I think some of these important diagnostics, um, understanding the genetic makeup, are that important to health that offering some of those incentives within the health plan, I think, would go a long way in driving some of this change. Okay. So uh, regarding some of the, the tools that, that you've implemented, were they uh, – did the impetus or the request for these tools come from the IT team? Did they say, hey, we could use something that helps us with this problem? Or were they sort of discovered by your team and then you, you know, ran them by the clinical folks? What was the uh, sort of genesis of that? And did you need to build a cost benefit in order to move forward? You know, in almost every case, uh, these ideas come from our clinical stakeholders who really understand the challenges that they are trying to face um, and, and manage. In some cases, they know the problem. They don't yet know a solution, and our, our IT team can go out and help find the solution. Uh, but many times, they bring us both a couple of potential solutions, and, and we investigate those. In some cases, it's been, you know, local startup companies uh, entrepreneurs and in some cases academic scholars who are who have the idea uh, want to do a proof of concept on a very new product and more and more we are partnering with with new companies like that um, and then giving our clinical subject matter expertise our IT subject matter expertise to help launch those products in all cases we are looking at that potential return on investment um, and even starting to look a little bit more broadly at what we're calling value on investment. Uh, it may not always be easy to specifically translate to hard dollars, but improving the patient experience uh, adds value, which is uh, a key mission uh, for us. Very good. Um, next question, do you feel the reimbursement for telemedicine is coming along quickly enough? And I know there's state-by-state state issues here, but what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I don't think it is. Um, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, uh, at both the federal and state level, the, the language in many of the regulations um, are not keeping pace with, with the technology. Um, you know, as we think about our function as an accountable care organization and the need to take risk on the overall care, right? We're moving away from traditional fee-for-service models to really being paid on quality and value. Um, in some cases, while the reimbursement for the individual telemedicine visit may not be what it needs to be or what it should be, in the overall cost of care, it's, it's allowing us to improve access, um, and, and so we're doing it anyway, or certain types of visits that are not independently reimbursed anyway, that they're part of an overall bundle. Um, but I do think the, the federal and state regulations um, need to be enhanced and improved. Te telemedicine will become the routine way that, that we deliver care. You know, our, my goal is for every one of my physicians to be able to deliver a video visit for any patient they feel appropriate whenever they feel appropriate um, and not have to think about whether that particular visit type is reimbursed by what payer. Um, again, if we're truly keeping the patients at, at the center of why we're here, the ability to offer it electronically just has to be there. Um, and so I hope that at both the federal and, and private payer levels that that, that all comes about. Right, right, very good. Uh, the patient story, is that something you've piloted in certain areas? Uh, if so, do you plan to roll it out across the organization? Yeah, we do. So um, we started with uh, three or four of our physicians who their role in the pilot is to actively introduce the ability for patients to create that patient story. Um, and once the patient creates the story, it's universally available in our electronic medical record. So 
even beyond that small group of early adopters, any clinician that then is caring for that patient will have the ability to see the patient's story. So we start slow just to be sure, um, you know, there's always a, we don't know what we don't know, uh, either from a technical perspective uh, or as, you know, patients react. Uh, and, and we wanted that input from clinicians and patients, and then we ultimately will will deploy it across the organization. Very good. Um, next question. Can you talk about your organization's EHR landscape? Any thoughts for those who don't have integrated systems on how they can uh, get the data in the right place to move forward with precision medicine? Yeah, so, you know, our EMR landscape, um, we have deployed a single electronic medical record across our enterprise. So um, we are a multi-hospital health system. Every one of our hospitals uh, is on the same instance of a single EMR, uh, as are the faculty physicians um, that we support at the Yale School of Medicine and our health systems uh, physician foundation. Um, we've also extended the EMR to independent community physicians um, as part of a, a clinical integration strategy. Um, you know, so I think that is a, a really pinnacle, uh, a real pinnacle in that strategy to be able to deliver and connect tools like this in the physician's workflow. Uh, but I would say even where that doesn't exist, um, working with clinicians and understanding whatever their workflow is, whether it's different EMRs, um, if by chance they're still documenting their clinical care on paper, uh, you know, many of these tools are, are simply available, um, you know, as web uh, tools. And so I, I think I, I wouldn't let the lack of a consolidated or integrated EMR preclude the use of, of some of these tools. Um, you know, I, I usually mention, um, you know, that the ability to deliver these as well through a mobile phone or mobile device, um, the, the World Health Organization has um, published this, a report that more people on the planet have access to a cell phone than to a toilet. And thinking about the prevalence of those devices and the ability to deliver whether it's a telemedicine visit through that mobile device or some of these applications, I think we have the ability to still do that. Ideally, it's in concert with an electronic medical record, but it doesn't always need to be. <clears throat> Very good. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. I just want to give you an opportunity uh, for some uh, one more question here. Lisa, I know you're very passionate about this. Um, for those who maybe uh, don't have a ton of resources, um, any sort of uh, low-hanging fruit to help them move in the direction that, that you're so passionate about moving in? <laughs> you know, I, I think my biggest recommendation is to always partner with the caregivers and clinicians and then to have a good network of patients and, and family advisors, you know, in the, the consumer population that we serve. Um, that will lead to the ability to develop some clear priorities, uh, and then even with limited resources, focusing them on those key priorities uh, will allow us to make progress towards some of these goals. And then, you know, I think even for a large organization like ours, um, none of this can be done alone, and partnering with other organizations in unique ways um, that are strategic, I think opens incredible doors. Um, you know, I, I also always say we, we will not compete on data. Services and tools like this are, are not going to be what differentiate us as a care provider. Um, and so the ability to share resources across organizations, none of us should be figuring out what these right solutions are, recreating the wheel. Um, we should be helping each other, you know, learn from lessons and successes so that we can all help drive population health as, as, as we strive to. Very good, very good. Well, that's about all we have time for today. When we close out, uh, when you close out your WebEx window, you'll be taken to a post-event survey. If you could answer that, we'd appreciate it. 
Um, continuing education, for those of you who hold the CHIME CHCIO certification, attending our webinars gets you one CEU. So let CHIME know you were here, and if you've asked us to do so, we will. If you need a certificate of attendance for a different CEU program, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll receive an email when this event has been posted to our YouTube channel. If you'd like us to produce a webinar for you, you can contact Nancy Wilcox and you can go to our website to view our upcoming schedule. So once again, I want to thank Lisa Stump very much for sharing such great information. I want to thank our attendees and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.